So the next space that I'd like to move into is talking a little bit about how to attach item types if you're working in the open roads environment. Uh, this is probably a recap for most of you, uh, nothing new here. So I'll go through it kind of quick, but there is some important information and we get a lot of questions still around this. You can certainly attach item types using the regular attach tool and you can do it through feature definitions. What you cannot and should not be doing is using element templates to store your item types. Now, the reason that we shouldn't be using element templates is very simple when you start looking at what a feature definition has. So here looking at just a, a typical linear feature definition, there are seven different element templates that get called here. If you start putting item types on element templates, how are you going to resolve that? Which one wins when you have feature definitions trying to use them? That's the number one reason why we didn't go down the path of element templates. The other is element templates and standard item types are far less flexible at having default values than what we can provide you through feature definitions. So you can put item type on a feature definition when you create those they automatically end up on those elements. It can be multiple item types, two, three, four, 10, whatever you need, and it will end up on those elements. Now, a couple things that get people into trouble sometimes, and we get some, some challenges with. Number one is where do I define my item types and my feature definitions? And what I would encourage you is to put them in the same DGN library. And the reason for that is that when you attach an item type to a feature definition, it gets copied into the file where that feature definition exists. So if your item types are defined in file A and your feature definitions in file B, it's going to copy that item type um, into file B anyway. So now which one is your master? Which one is really the owner of? Well, that kind of depends on how you set up the rest of your configuration variables, and, and it can get very confusing quickly. It's easier for most people, and it just simplifies your life of managing workspaces if you just keep the two in the same file. They don't have to be that way, but it does make life simpler. Now, I mentioned that feature definitions are better for or give you more power for defining defaults. Here's an example of that. So I've got a feature definition on the left for my single-sided guardrail. And I've got my pay item barrier item type attached to it. And I'm going to predefine it with a value for the description called metal beam rail type A. On the right, I've got a different feature definition for barrier cable, but the exact same item type on there. And that, and that but I have a different description assigned to that, which is pulling in a different item number in this case. So we've got two feature definitions, one item type with two different defaults. You can't do that with other methods of item types, only through feature definitions do you get that ability. Now, as you start putting item types on feature definitions, it is important to understand how propagation and data is protected. So, if you, after you have some production data, you go back and you add another item type to a feature definition, what happens to all your existing data? Those item types will automatically get added to any elements out there that use that feature definition. So if you add something, all elements throughout your ecosystem will get that eventually as those elements are opened and filed. However, if you delete or you change an item type on a feature definition, we will never reach out to your production data and remove anything. We're always going to protect that production data because we don't know if you maybe accidentally removed that item type from the feature definition. You're going to add it back in 30 seconds later. Last thing we would want to do is go delete that from all of your data in your production environment because there's no quick, easy way to add it back in. You can put the item type back on it, but they're all going to be blank. They're not going to have your properties. So we will never pull data off of or pull item type properties off of your elements. We'll only add them to them. You can 
pull data off of the elements yourselves if you want with the remove item type tool. Now, a big part of making item types functional in the civil environment is something that we call single source of truth. Something that exists in the civil environment that does not exist in the pure microstation environment is that we work in multiple models at the same time. 2D models, profile models, 3D models, and we have to keep some synchronization between those. Because you do not want your curb line in your 2D model and your curb line in the 3D model to have two different item types on it. You want that to be the same. And that's what we refer to as single source of truth. We do have that implemented um, for linear geometry and drainage elements. There is more coming on that. For example, point elements. This has not been implemented yet. We're still working on it for point elements. It's coming, um, but it's not there quite yet. So today, you could actually get separate item types on your 2D and your 3D point. So be careful of that um, because you could have conflicting data in there. Now, to understand a little bit about what happens also when we propagate item types because of the way civil geometry works. So as we work through civil geometry, if you had, let's say, two lines, and the first line I said was a type A curb, second line was a type B curb, and then I complex those two together, so they become one element. What item type should go on that element? Is it the type A or is it the type B? Well, this is what we call propagation and, and conflict resolution. What you can do, or, or what it, the system does, is it defines that it's either going to use the first item you select, the last item you select, or neither of the items when it's propagating item types forward. There is a default definition for all of those geometry commands as to how it does that propagation, but you can also customize that in your environment if you choose by defining the item type property map path configuration variable and pointing it to a particular file that's in a JSON format. We do provide an example of this in our delivered workspace. Here's a snippet out of that file of what it looks like. It specifies a particular command and what that override is. Again, the overrides can either be none, first, or last. And these are the various commands that this prioritization works on. So how you want them to behave when you are doing things with item types. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you and see you next time.